بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم السلام علیکم دس از امنا گل فرام دا ڈپارٹمنٹ آف جرنلزم اینڈ ماس کمیونیکیشن وہ آر بیک ود کورس فنڈامنٹلس آف پبلک ریلیشنس ویرنگ دا گڈ جی ایم سی تھری تھری ون ایز ویل ایز دا کورس ایڈورٹائزنگ فار میڈیا ویرنگ دا گڈ جی ایم سی تھری تھری ٹو اٹس اے ٹوئنٹی سیکنڈ لیکچر اینڈ دا ٹاپک ٹوڈے از امپورٹنس آف پرسویژن اینڈ دین ویل موو ٹوڈس دا ڈسکشن آف ایلیبریشن لائک ہڈ ماڈل آف پرسویژن see the most influential people in the world have long been able to persuade their audiences to think and act in a certain way for example apple founder steve jobs has often been called a corporate storyteller yes a corporate storyteller who has no equal in terms of effective communication and presentation Apple gained a lot from their former leader who talked with conviction and enthusiasm as demonstrated by his 2007 iPhone launch. <clears throat> Another well-known figure is Bill Gates with Microsoft, who is widely considered a beacon of change in the world. He is hailed for his ability to break down complex issues in a simplified manner. His speeches highlighting the need for humanitarian work are both moving and impactful. So leaders and visionaries who usher in a better tomorrow with their ability to communicate that vision with ease. As a budding entrepreneur, be you uh, related to with advertising or public relations, your ability to succeed does not only depend on your capabilities, but rather how well you express them. In order to pull in resources and contacts, you need to learn to convey your ideas through the power of words so in this class today we'll be discussing why persuasion is important we'll move towards elaboration likelihood model and then we'll uh, discuss some of the techniques of persuasion see every day we meet people but rarely do they rarely do they last leave a lasting impression on us The chosen few who manage to stand out are those who impress us with their words. These are people who speak with conviction about their beliefs and ideas. Their ability to articulate their point of view and connect with the listener is tremendous. They know the power they hold and can easily impact how you think and act according to their agenda. When you can relate to someone's words, then they are already exerting their influence on you. And this is what you need to understand. You need to have these skills, whether you are in public relations or related to advertising. So we'll discuss, start our discussion with why persuasion is important. Have you ever bargained with a salesperson, for example, to lower the price of any article that you are buying? Or have you wanted to negotiate a raise in pocket money with your parents? or have you ever needed to give a presentation in front of a group which you have already done a lot of times with me or had you had an argument with a friend over a controversial topic <clears throat> or made a complaint over the phone or have you ever written an essay composed a letter applying for a scholarship read a book watched an advertisement or contributed to a blog what do you need to do all these things well You need rhetoric. Rhetoric is a fundamental building block of good education. Whether it is followed by specializing in journalism, advertising, public relations, or even pursuing academic research, clear thinking, good argument, and logical discussions are essential to academic student success in any discipline and field. And it does not stand for, uh, true for academics only. It's for the professional life as well. The better the essays you write, the better you grade. The stronger the presentations you make, the greater your academic success. Same is the case with your interviews. If you present yourself well, you, <clears throat> you have a better chance, a better probability of getting that job. So when you're trying to influence people, you need to not only sell yourself, but help consumers understand how your product or your service or your brand will make their life easier, better, amazing. 
So persuasion in public relations and advertising is important because of the upcoming reasons which I am just going to explain to you. So the first one is the principle of liking. We all want to be liked. It's human nature to want to learn uh, return favors when someone does something for us. Uh, in public relations, the favor may be handing out a hot story to a reporter or placing a press release with the right publication for a colleague. Stopping to get tea for another employee may end up benefiting you because at some point in the future you'll need help. A journalist or a magazine may be willing to listen when you let them know your ideas or pitch a story if you have proven to be a good source in the past. When you find the things that others like, it gives you a foundation to talk about common interests. When common interests are discovered, it builds trust in a relationship. Something as simple as noticing the brand of phone someone is using allows you to start a conversation. Opening a dialogue gives up that more <clears throat> opening up dialogue gives up that <clears throat> cheerful moment of pleasant conversation, but it also gives us more. Listening to others opens up the thought process and may spark ideas and solutions. Also, uh, a different perspective gives us a chance to see problems that can be solved or possibly a different way to use a product. That opens another revenue stream without having to come up with a different product. Friendly conversations also improve our skills and understanding of how to communicate more effectively. That means our powers of persuasion can improve. So see, <clears throat> this is very, very much important. Then the second thing is authority. When you establish someone's credentials through something as simple as showing the number of years they have worked in their field or some proof of their top-level performance in the past, you bring credibility and authority to their support or endorsement. People love to know who is qualified and are more likely to go with someone who knows what they are doing. Um, think of your doctor. You always want to know that he or she is the best in their field and in the area you live. Same is the case with your mechanic even. If you have own a bike or a, <clears throat> a four-wheeler, you're particular that the mechanic you are taking your vehicle to is the best in his field in the area you live. So this matters. Social proof. Clients need to know that an advertising agency or a PR firm representing a brand or a product is not only effective but ethical. They may learn of products and services from billboards, social media, speaking engagement, books and even pamphlets. But your persuasion is basically about you being ethical as well. So it's a social proof. Consistency. It is important to be consistent. Consider the elections where many signs were put up to promote the importance of voting. In those areas where multiple signs were out, voter turnout increased. This can apply in both public relations and advertising. Getting someone to consider your ideas or products often helps the client in presentations and media. This is usually much more effective than flooding someone's email box. Finally, scarcity. When something is harder to get or obtain, don't we all want it that much? I mean, in my place, even for example, if it is noodles, and they, that is the last pack of noodles, so everybody would love to have noodles that day. <clears throat> So best examples happen every year for brands festive collection when there is always one particular dress that customers want and because they all want it, it sells out early and becomes hard to find. This principle also applies to advertising. If an item is scarce and people want it, then it is easier to market to that select group with excess. Persuasive public relation presents these same principles in written and oral form to the public but it doesn't end there. Persuasive public relation works best when integrity and honesty are part of the presentation. It's not about selling something that may not be necessary. It's about establishing a relationship 
that lasts and brings consumers back to the client time and time again. So, basically, persuasion is very, very much important for both public relations and for advertising because it naturally and ends up in a long-term relationship. So, <clears throat> this persuasion is quite very important. I'll say a few more, more words about the importance of per, uh, persuasive communication. See, persuasive communication can be impactful and with practice, anybody, yes, anybody can develop these, um, these abilities. The first one is charisma. When you can convince people easily and sell your vision, you are seen as an extraordinary personality. Many strong speakers are a brand unto themselves simply because their words are their greatest selling tool. Secondly, manipulation, manipulation can be a useful tool if used with the right intentions. One can use this talent to get customers to buy products or to motivate employees. So, if you are, you are uh, using it to <clears throat> get customers to buy products, this is your advertising end. And when you are using it for motivating employees, it's your public relations end. So, it is very, very much important. It happens mm, to be the right skill. Then, being relatable. When you speak like you understand people and their requirements, you immediately become relatable. This will draw people to you, whether that be in a personal sense or a business sense in terms of your customers or your employees or your peers. So this is once again very much important. So persuasive communication is very much important overall, but specifically with uh, public relations and advertising because these depend on persuasive skills of their employees or of the staff. Now we'll move towards... Uh, a uh, theory of persuasion, I would like to share a model with you. <clears throat> this is called elaboration likelihood model of persuasion. Uh, as public relations and advertising, they have become uh, even more scientific in their practice, especially with the advent of big data and the interest in the links between psychology and communication. It is time to re-evaluate persuasion. In order to understand how it works and how a study of it can make our practice more effective. One of the most effective or most famous academic models that helps us understand the persuasion process better is the elaboration likelihood model. It's called ELM as well. It was de developed in 1986. This model suggests that there are two routes to persuasion. The central and the peripheral, as you can see in the greens. <clears throat> I'll explain the whole model in upcoming slides, so you don't need to worry about it. The correct route for <clears throat> the correct route for the chosen target audience depends on a number of factors, such as the factors are given to towards the, the other side of the screen, which is audience's motivation to follow the argument ability to understand the argument and the opportunity to engage. So this is a simple uh, illustration of the model. Now we'll explain, we'll discuss each element of it. First, I'll start off with the, the three things in yellow. That is the likelihood, uh, which explains the likelihood of elaboration. To determine which route to use, the model says that three factors determine whether your elaboration is likely to be high. These are the first one, motivation. If you have a high desire to process the message you are receiving, then your motivation will be high. For example, uh, imagine the government announced new stipends for recently graduated students who are um, currently not employed. So if you think your friends might avail of this opportunity or your siblings, then you are going to be more motivated to, th to think about this issue than someone who isn't personally affected. The second one is ability. Even if we want to elaborate, it can be difficult if we don't have the ability. This can happen when, for example, yes, you are in a noisy environment 
or when you don't have enough knowledge about a subject to be able to think deeply about it. For example, if you take my example, I'm not uh, very much techno friendly. So if, for example, it's just buying something as simple as a laptop. So I, I might not be able to elaborate on it. So third thing, opportunity. Having the opportunity means you have the time available to receive the message, process it, and then make your decision. So not everybody has the opportunity. So on these three base factors, it is dependent whether the person would elaborate or they would not elaborate. That is whether they will use central processing or the peripheral processing. So I'm going to explain each one in detail. Now moving towards the processing routes, the first one was central processing route or central root processing. Central root processing happens when elaboration is higher. Using central root processing, you listen carefully to the message and evaluate the pros and cons before making your decision. Central root processing requires your conscious thought and critical thinking. To be able to process in this way, you must be motivated, having the ability and the opportunity. Through central process, root processing, you can form attitudes and even beliefs. Views formed through central root processing tend to be long-lasting. When you create an attitude or view in this way, you are less likely to change your mind about it later and more likely to behave in ways that match your new position. Now coming to peripheral root processing. When one or more of the motivation, ability or opportunity is missing or low, then you are more likely to process information via the peripheral route. Using the peripheral route, you are not consciously examining information and you will may often make your decision based on uh, positive and negative cues that you have picked, uh, what you have seen others do. Uh, in essence, you are trying to decide without investing any real thinking time. Mm, kind of uh, peripheral root processing is, in, is essential because you simply don't have the time to consider every decision you make carefully. By making the minor decisions on autopilot using peripheral processing, you, you free up more time to think about the more significant decisions you need to make. Because you haven't invested a real, uh, any real effort into the decision-making process, you don't cling to attitudes formed using this route as strongly as you would if the central route had created those attitudes. Uh, note that the two attitudes, uh, the two routes are not binary options. We can use both at the same time. Sometimes um, we might, uh, for example, you mostly use central you, uh, route processing while uh, with a little bit of peripheral root processing sometimes you might mostly use peripheral root processing with a little bit of central root processing so both exist on a sliding scale having said that i would like to share a video narrating the same uh, elaboration likelihood model i hope you understand that and then we'll move further Take the time to really think about it. If you have to buy a new car, for example, you'll probably give a lot of thought to which car is best for you. You'll read information, listen to people, watch commercials. Putting information together like this and really thinking about it is elaborating. Now, we don't always do this much work. How likely are we to do all this thinking? That's what the elaboration likelihood model is about. How likely are you to elaborate, to think hard about what you read? If you're the kind of person who does a lot of thinking about all this information, then you're using what this model calls central root processing. You're really paying attention to the central details. However, some people make decisions based on peripheral root processing. They don't read much at all about cars. They buy one that looks nice or one that a friend already owns. People like this are paying attention to peripheral information, information that's not really central to what the product is. 
and even people who typically use central root processing might sometimes use peripheral roots. We can all be influenced by what attractive people or smart people tell us, and we sometimes make decisions without thinking about them. So elaboration like to go, how likely are you to use central root processing? Really thinking hard about something. Or peripheral root processing, allowing yourself to be influenced by things that really aren't that important. I hope you found the explanation easy for you and you were able to understand that how central root processing works and how peripheral root processing works. Why do we need to understand this thing? Because when we want to influence someone, we need to understand how they work, how their minds work. So we need to plan our communication accordingly. That is why we need to know this thing. Since we are discussing all about persuasion, we need to understand what are the techniques of persuasion. So we'll be discussing three rhetorical appeals. Among the techniques of persuasion, we need to focus on these three uh, rhetorical appeals. The first one is a thos, which is your materials and resources. These should be trustworthy and convince people that you are right. Also in this aspect, your way of speaking, it should also engage the audience. Logos is the way of showing uh, Logos is the way of showing that you have an organized speech or logical argument that is related to your sources. If you use unbiased, accurate so resources, people will assume you have a very sh strong and logical argument. <clears throat> also, you can use your personal experience or some well-known experiences to support your point. Basically, like um, you do not only give an argument, but have a full explanation and support your argument. Then pathos. This relates your emotional part. A good speaker should be able to stir the audience's feelings. Uh, let people agree with you. You, uh, you use logical argument, but you also use emotional strategy to appeal audience to follow you. This skill will be effective if you want to or want your audience to change their behaviors or let them do some actions. The three rhetorical appeals as discussed by Aristotle are ethos, pathos and logos. These three appeals are guided by kairos, which is about timing. The three appeals may be used alone, but arguments are most effective when they combine appeals to ethos, pathos and logos with strong grounding in karas or timeliness. I'll be explaining each one in detail. We'll start off with ethos. Ethos, a Greek word for character, ethos is an appeal to character, especially authority and expertise. Ethos is often mistaken as an appeal to ethics, Though ethics are an aspect of a person's or an organization's ethos, ethics are not on the only component of character, authority, or expertise. Celebrity and other endorsements are often based on ethos. Ethos is why an American Dental Association endorsement of a toothpaste is more powerful and generally holds most, more sway than an endorsement from a non-medical professional. At the same time, though, Ethos, as it relates to advertising, is a bit complex. Sometimes people or organizations will have strong ethos, not because they are professionals in a given field, such as dentistry, but because they may demonstrate the ideal results or benefits of a product. So ethos focuses attention on the writer's or speaker's trustworthiness. It takes one of the two forms, which is appeal to character or appeal to credibility. A writer may show ethos through her tone, such as taking care to show more than one side of an issue before arguing for her side. When you use a counter argument to show an opposing side to an issue before explaining why your thesis is still correct, you use ethos. Other times, the author may rely on his reputation for honesty or his experience in a particular field. Advertising that relates on doctor statements or political records often uses an appeal to ethos. I think it's more appropriate if you watch a video advertisement that uses um, ethos for persuasion, and then we'll continue with our discussion of ethos. So here we are.
So this was an example of a thos, but how it was actually the airline actually showed that if such important celebrities, such important players, if they are using this airline, obviously it is a more, very credible airline. So that was a way of saying it without actually stating it in words. So this is like now this is building up the ethos of that airline. Ethos can be. <clears throat> Ethos can be developed by choosing language that is appropriate for the audience and topic. This also means choosing the proper level of vocabulary, making yourself sound fair or unbiased, introducing your expertise, accomplishments, or your degree, and by using correct grammar and syntax. During public speaking events, typically a speaker will have at least some of his degree and accomplishments listed upon introduction by a master of the ceremony so that people tend to pay, uh, pay attention to that person. Okay, th th this person is so and so, he has achieved this and that, so that kind of a thing. As for advertising, uh, establishing credibility when attempting to call an audience to an action, such as buying a product, encompasses a wide range of details, which can sometimes be entirely specific to the medium on which the advertisement is being delivered. Approaches can widely vary whether an advertisement is delivered in a purely audio, static graphic, or video format. Whether an advertisement is delivered via digital advertising, billboard, street furniture, print publication, or television could also potentially have a source effect on the ethos of the advertisement and the brand or product that uh, and of the brand or product the ad is attempting to promote. Additionally, the content and reputation associated with a certain website or publication can have affect uh, the ethos of the advertisement. So approaches to establishing ethos can also depend entirely on the industry and branding strategy. In many cases, it is not about having a better or worse ethos. Rather, the goal would be to establish a connection to the ethos of existing groups of people. A different ad strategy and associated product or brand ethos would be required to appeal to each. However, there should be a clear distinction between establishing a desired ethos surrounding a specific advertisement or campaign and advertising products which can be or attempt to establish a personal ethos. In essence, one is easier to establish the other. When promoting their products, advertisers will attempt to persuade customers that the ethos associated with any given product will transfer itself to the user of the product. Some of the best examples of this are advertisements for designer clothing and automobiles. For example, um, take Gucci or Mercedes. Both of these products, product categories are closely associated with a sense of individual style and status. And many people buy these products to establish or promote a certain personal ethos that they believe is already associated with the product. Marketing for these kinds of goods normally attempts to connect the product to a certain way of life, personal image, or social status. You might be very well aware that people tend to differentiate between iPhones and uh, Android phones. iPhone is a total different class, so it, it is <coughs> people tend to buy uh, iPhone for the ethos even. Otherwise, there are certain people who do not find it that user-friendly, but still, people buy it for the ethos. Now, ethos in public speaking and oral presentations, which is very relevant to public relations. In oral presentations and debates, speakers knowingly and unknowingly utilize ethos in a number of ways. The easiest example of this is to see the choice of dress and physical appearance. In this aspect, different audiences and events will beget different attire. A speaker at a sports convention would most likely dress themselves more differently than one at a convocation. During any oral presentation, two key elements, just about equal in importance, will almost certainly be necessary to effectively present to any given audience. One is calmness, 
and certain confidence in the fact that you know what you're talking about. Of course, achieving this usually requires preparation as well as a solid understanding of the presentation or speech topic. One aspect of this is keeping on topic and having a solid point-to-point -point agenda for subjects vital to the coherency of the presentation. The second key element is to introduce pedigree and experience in the subject of discussion. This is especially important during key industry and academic events where many audience members are either familiar in the topic of discussion or an expert in it themselves. Typically, at least some of this work should be done prior to any speech by a master of ceremony. However, <clears throat> it still may be a good idea to touch back to anecdotes of accomplishments and projects that the audience would likely be interested in during the speaking engagement. While introducing pedigree and experience, there can sometimes be a fine line between demonstrating knowledge and industry experience and sounding mm, somewhat arrogant. On this note, having a degree of calmness when speaking about your experiences and knowledge can in many cases offset this effect. Demonstrate as much expertise as necessary and leave the act of impressing the audience up to your presentation. During any class presentations, below the high school or undergraduate level, pedigree and expertise are negligible, as the audience is typically of peers who will not only ex not expect anything more of a speaker than being their classmate. Any existing expertise or pedigree in presentation like this are just a bonus point. So here we would conclude that according to Aristotle, our perception of a speaker or a writer's character influences how believable or convincing we find what that person has to say. This projected character is called the character uh, is called the speaker or writer's ethos. We are naturally more likely to be persuaded by a person who we think has personal warmth, consideration of others, a good mind, and solid bearing. Learning. Often we know something of the character of speakers and writers ahead of time. They come with a reputation or extrinsic ethos. People whose education, experience, and previous performances qualify them to speak on a certain issue earn the special extrinsic ethos of the authority. But whether or not we know anything about the speaker or writer ahead of time, the actual text we hear or read, the way it is written or spoken, and what it says, always conveys an impression of the author's character. This impression created by the text itself is the in intrinsic ethos. Institutions, public roles, and publications also project an ethos or credibility. We assume, for example, that the New York Times is more credible source than the News International or the Daily Dawn. And we usually assume that a person selected for a position of responsibility or honor is more credible than someone without official sanction. Having said that, we'll conclude our lecture today and we'll continue with the techniques of uh, persuasion in upcoming lectures as well. Thank you.